Hello there, everybody. I'm Christian Pettit. I'm with Flotwig Separation Technology. Uh, we've put together a little webinar here today. We're going to talk about centrifuges and craft breweries, uh, specifically the disc stack separator centrifuges, so the, the ones that we use for final clarification of beer. Um, hope everybody's doing good today, doing well. The uh, weather is beautiful here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Hope it is where you are too. Um, it's a great day to drink beers, even though it's Monday. We can still drink beers on Monday. Uh, all right, so first thing we're going to do, talk about Flotwig just a little bit real quick, just to, I guess, throw our credentials out there, let everybody know that we do uh, what we do. So uh, 1911, Flotwig was started by a guy named Gustav Otto. His father was uh, the inventor of the internal combustion engine, so everybody's heard that story back in the day, the automobile. Um, Flotwig had made... Uh, airplane engines, made motorbikes, made all kinds of stuff up until uh, World War II. And then obviously after that, they had to find something else to do. So they started making decanter centrifuges. It was their, uh, their first foray into the centrifuge world. The first one they were built in the 1950s is still being used in the BASF in Germany, um, but probably more of an exhibition thing than anything at this point. These days, we still have a large factory in Germany, but we've also got a large facility in the United States here in Northern Kentucky. Um, service, engineering, parts, repairs, everything like that goes on there. We've got a total of about 90 employees. Um, we've also got several employees spread out around the US to cover all the different regions as far as sales goes. Uh, worldwide, Flotwig has activities in more than 100 countries, 50 service centers around the world, 12 international subsidiaries. Flotwig, Flotwig US is the largest of those subsidiaries, uh, but also China, Russia, Brazil, some other uh, fairly large ones. So we'll get right into the brewery process stuff here. Um, there are a lot of different places and breweries where you can implement this sort of technology. There are many centrifuge and uh, separation applications in the brewery. We've worked on lots of them throughout the years. Uh, the most common though is the, the separator for uh, clarification of beer. We do use the, the decanters for, for hot wort, uh, separating trube from the whirlpool uh, to recover the, the beer lost with the trube piles. We use them in the cellar sometimes for uh, heavy fermenter bottoms. If you make a lot of really hoppy beers and the uh, a lot of fermenter additions. There's a lot of sludge that can be developed in the bottom of those tanks that typically has to be dumped out before you can go to filtration or for a clarifying centrifuge. So um, the decanter is pretty pretty popular for that application. There's a lot of beer to be recovered there, a lot of yield to be uh, recovered. So those are pretty popular in breweries. The Flotwig SETI canter is a different kind of machine, which is uh, designed more for a very homogeneous mixture. Uh, typically, that would be um, in a large scale brewery like spent yeast would all be collected in a one big tank, kept uh, mixed and then dewatered by that uh, type of machine. The beer can then be recovered and put back into the uh, front end of the brewery and slowly added back to, to increase volume as well. <clears throat> That's more of a, a macro brew, brew sort of uh, solution. And then uh, finally, the Flawig decanter after filtrate or for the filtration step, but more for dewatering the filter media. So some large breweries that have uh, uh, diatomaceous earth or Kissel Gore coated filters, those uh, that material can be dewatered and prepared for landfill to uh, as a waste product. Um, that's also a, a macro brew sort of uh, application for for centrifuge in a brewery, but is used though. So we'll uh, move into the information about the disc stack centrifuge, centrifuge for clarification. Um, basically, this is the, the most common way of doing it for, for most uh, breweries once they get to any uh, size. Um, it's a very good way to pre-clarify or to clarify the beer. Um, in German brewing, typically this is pre-clarification because they almost all use filters. But I know here in the U.S., most craft brewers are not uh, not so into using filters. So this would end up being the, the final clarification step. Um, this does reduce the necess necessity of filters and additives for the filtration, such as Kissel Gore, Diatomaceous Earth. Um, and like I said, it is, a, it is in most cases a replacement for a filter in a, in a craft brewery in the U.S. Um, they typically have low oxygen pickup. That's one thing that's obviously critical with this sort of process. Anything in the cellar, you never want to have any uh, oxygen pickup with your beer. 
<clears throat> if it does, uh, obviously that's going to be a problem and you're going to end up having a product go bad in the container and the package. So one thing we always strive for with the, the world of disk stack centrifuges is to keep them sealed up good. There's different ways of doing that. Uh, we'll talk about those. Solids discharge system with pump. You can collect the solids into the uh, cyclone with these machines and pump the solids away rather than just letting it get washed down the drain or uh, go into your wastewater, which is uh, beneficial if you're in a large area, an urban area that has uh, fees or uh, fines for, for solids discharged into the wastewater. Um, precise and consistent discharges, which go a long way towards your, towards your yield uh, increase. If you're discharging too often or doing complete discharges, uh, you're losing product. So that's something that uh, we'll talk about. Simple integration into CIP systems. Most of these centrifuge systems are, in fact, automated. Um, it's a matter of plugging your CIP chemical lines into it and uh, just running through the CIP sequence uh, that's programmed into the system. Gentle product treatment. We don't want to rough the beer up. We have to uh, make sure that the uh, turbulence is minimal inside these machines and we uh, take care of our product and energy efficient. So there's different types of drive systems for centrifuges. And obviously the, what you want is the most efficient one so that you're not paying excess costs for uh, energy. So the first, uh, the first place in the brewery where we would look at the clarification of beer uh, or we'd look at the clarifier centrifuge in the brewery is just the clarification before filtration or without filtration. So this is the, the finishing of your product uh, going into the bright tank or going into the buffer tank before the filter, um, taking the, the beer that uh, you're basically going to package and clarifying it. So you can see in the picture there, it shows a storage tank or which is basically your conical fermenter. Uh, you would feed the centrifuge from there, clarify the beer, go into the buffer tank, or that could be your bright beer tank if you're not uh, planning to filter after that. And then you basically have your finished product ready for packaging. Um, European breweries, like I said, obviously use a lot of filtration, so that's a, a more common diagram for them. But also here sometimes in the U.S. when we want to make lagers and pilsners, that's a pretty, uh, pretty common way of doing it as well. <clears throat> obviously it can be used with or without the... Uh, filter and this kind of shows a quick description or shows a quick picture of uh, beer going in versus beer coming out. So the beer on the right, a little cloudier, beer on the left would be the uh, finished product. Another place that we use these machines is for the clarification of green beer. Um, this is also a little bit on the German style, but there are some uh, U.S. breweries that we've worked with that are doing this as well, basically to, uh, to clarify the beer before further fermentation or before dry hopping. Um, stop fermentation. This can also be uh, popular in large breweries because especially for loggers, they do this a lot with the uh, large commercial breweries. But then in the smaller breweries, we see a lot of people who would like to do this with uh, barrel aged beers. They can clarify the beer and stop fermentation, make sure that everything is where they want it before they put it into the barrels to let it lay down and age for a while. Um, this is something that we have found to be useful in the craft beer world. Um, those particular barrels were delicious. I sampled them myself. <clears throat> and the final place that we would use this disc stack vertical centrifuge for would be the adjustment of turbidity. So if uh, we're not necessarily trying to make a bright beer, but perhaps we're making a, a hazy, which are all that pretty popular right now, hazy or New England IPA or a Hefeweizen or anything else where we would have a, like to have a certain amount of haze or uh, cloudiness in the beer. We would use a centrifuge with oftentimes we can use an additional line on there, which is called the bypass system. We would use a third turbidity measurement to allow the unclarified or untreated beer to bypass the system and rejoin the clarified beer on the way to the bright beer tank. So you're basically clarifying all but a little bit of the beer and adding some back to leave a certain amount of turbidity in it. Um, we find this especially popular with some of the German breweries making the Hefeweizens and things like that. It's a little bit of a, a cost adder, so not, a, not so many craft breweries would opt for this. I think the, the more common ways that a craft brewery would use a system like this to make a cloudy or a hazy beer would be 
uh, more to just use the inlet versus the outlet co turbidity control and either adjust the bowl speed to turn the g-force down a little bit so they wouldn't separate quite so much or they would speed the feed rate up a little bit you know kind of crank the beer through there a little bit faster so it doesn't pull as much solid material out just the heavy solids and leaves the, the lighter solid or the, the haze and i don't even call it a solid it's more really just a fine haze that wouldn't be taken out uh without giving it some more time in the centrifuge. So just a high flow rate, quick pass through there and uh, adjust the turbidity like that. And uh, here's a little bit about turbidity adjustment. The separator can be used after fermentation to remove the yeast and hot particles. Lower G-force or higher throughput allows for the removal of heavy solids while leaving a stable haze. So that's what everybody's looking for these days is that stability, shelf stability, nothing settling in their cans or their bottles. Like I said, the third turbidity meter allows for the system to automatically and adjust and maintain precise turbidity. So um, it's a little bit more work to do it without the without the bypass system, but uh, a little bit more cost effective is the, the gist of that. Some performance figures, product quality information, uh, things you could expect from a system like this if you were to implement one into your brewery. Um, dry matter of the yeast and true, basically what we're separating out the solids, the machine will discharge this stuff at anywhere from 20 to 25% dry solids by weight. Um, typically when you're talking about yeast that is still pumpable, so it's still a soft pasty solid, easy enough to, uh, to pump and get rid of the loss of the viability of yeast uh, is generally around 5%. So you still can uh, repitch and reuse some of this yeast. Um, Temperature pickup, typically less than one degree Celsius. There's um, most of these are uh, cooled machines and you're not going to see any real appreciable temperature pickup. Oxygen pickup is always guaranteed to be less than 20 parts per billion. And you might see some different figures on that depending on uh, who you talk to, who you ask and what kind of machine it is, what type of seal they have. There are different types of seals with these machines to, uh, to do that. Um, no significant difference in the uh, glucan gel formation. That's something that uh, laboratory wise they've determined they don't really get much effect on. Um, no beer spoiling microbes after the centrifuge. Uh, we go to great lengths to make sure that these are sanitary and the CIP sequence is effective. Uh, so much so that we don't even see beer spoiling microbes in the yeast or in the flushing water after the CIP. So basically, um, we're cleaning every end, inlet and outlet of the, the systems during CIP cleaning. And that's a, that's a pretty critical uh, point there. You always want to make sure that these things uh, go through the full CIP sequence and clean every single last little bit of it, because obviously that's the, the enemy in the uh, cellar. If we were to look at a, uh, a basic, and this is a real simplified drawing here of uh, basically what you see if you were to take a cross section of one of these machines. Um, the feed comes in through the top and the feed pipe. There are some bottom fed machines as well, again, depending on what manufacturer and what type you, uh, what type you opt for. Also that comes in with the uh, different size machines as well. But for the average craft brewery, they're probably going to be looking at a machine more like this the feed coming in from the top, uh, solids collect in the, uh, in the bottom of the bowl there at the, uh, where the bowl angle is where you can see the yeast discharging. I collect around there until either the outlet turbidity of the beer climbs up to a predetermined point or till it hits a timer. Uh, when one of those conditions is met, then the bowl will open up, discharge that yeast, and then close back up, which all happens within like a couple of microseconds. It's just a quick blip, discharges a bunch of a uh, solid and then closes back up and continues clarifying. This shows a machine with a hydrohermetic seal, which is a, uh, way of sealing the top of the machine to prevent oxygen, but rather than having a mechanical seal wearing on a shaft, it simply puts a layer of water into the top where it uh, uses deaerated water so there's no oxygen to be absorbed into the product. With this kind of setup, you can guarantee, as I said, less than 20 parts per billion of oxygen pickup. Um, and again, it's also, there's no mechanical seal and there's no wear on the shaft. So it's uh, one less part that you have to replace down the road, which coming from the service side, I'm a big fan of that. 
So here you can see a little bit more complete view of a separator and uh, its components. And this slide just details a few of the uh, design features or a couple of the main points for these type of machines. The foundation or frame, basically that's just an elevation stand that the machine is set on. The base is uh, typically cast steel or cast stainless steel. Um, it's obviously pretty important. It's the whole the whole foundation of the machine that's uh, holding it all together. So that's a critical point. Drive system. Most uh, most centrifuges are going to have uh, electric motor drive. There's a few hydraulic designs out there, but not really so much in the beverage industry. Um, one thing that's real key is what type of drive you have. So this is a, a belt drive system. There are some out there that are uh, gear drive where you have a, a 90 degree um, bell drive gear that uh, the motor goes into and you kind of have a power or a mechanical transmission driving the bowl. In my opinion, those are a little bit uh, maintenance heavy. It's kind of tough to work on a transmission compared to just changing the drive belt on some pulleys. Um, and then you also have some direct drive machines, which have their place as well, but I'm not a huge fan of having to pick up the entire machine to work on a, uh, work on a motor. So as there are uh, the different types that you can run into the belt down here is, uh, what the motor's driving, which turns the bowl. Um, like I said, belt drive is pretty simple, pretty easy to work on. Um, low maintenance, simply a matter of make sure the belt tension is right and replacing it, uh, once a year or so. The spindle. The entire rotating assembly is mounted upon the spindle. And the spindle, so I guess this is probably the service-wise, the most critical part of the machine. It has the bearings attached to it. Um, it has a taper where the bowl sits onto it and then uh, connects is uh, secured through the top. Um, typically, when you when you have a major service on a centrifuge, the spindle is something that they have to, they have to pull it out. They have to inspect it. They have to change the bearings on it. Um, some companies will have complete spindles already built so they don't have to be rebuilt on site. That's a, in my opinion, that's a nice feature to be able to just change that out rather than having to, to rebuild that whole spindle on site. So uh, something to look into would be to ask if a potential supplier has a spindle exchange program or uh, they provide those. The bowl itself, this is your rotating element. So as the bowl rotates, it uh, obviously separates the solids from the liquid via centrifugal force. Um, this is the single, probably largest, most expensive piece of the, the machine because it is the rotating element. It is uh, very critical. That and the spindle are the two most uh, dimensionally and uh, functionally critical parts of the machine. The connections at the top obviously have your feed inlet, your product outlet, and seal water and uh, other connections right there at the top. The housing, so this basically just covers the bowl, provides the uh, the cavity for the solids to discharge into before they're uh, pumped away. And then the lubrication system. So down here at the bottom, you've got your spindle lubrication. Typically, these are recirculating lubrication systems that will oil the bearings and drip back into the reservoir uh, before oiling again. So uh, a closed circuit lubrication system. And this is a, this slide is a picture that just shows it in a little more detail. And I like this picture because it shows the discs where they're stacked and you can also see the cutouts at the bottom of each disc, the, the scalloped uh, areas at the bottom which they do to provide more sludge space and a little bit more, uh, um, a little bit more space for the heavy solids, because in this kind of application, we're seeing a lot more of the, the hops and larger solids particles. It's not just, not just small yeast particles that we're separating here. Um, you can also see where the blue color is the, uh, the Royal blue there. That's the path where the operating water would flow through, um, which causes controls the opening and closing of the bowl uh the discharge of the solids so when when that water pressure is turned off for just a split second the bowl will drop and you can see the bottom half of the bowl and i don't know if my cursor would show it but the bottom half of the bowl where the seal the bowl seal is that's where it opens up and shoots the solids out and so it's just a, a quick blip as quick as you can blink the thing opens and closes and uh, discharges those solids out of there 
So some energy advantages and disadvantages for this type of system um, with a belt drive versus direct drive uh, is one of their arguments here. Somewhat higher footprint for a belt drive by just a bit, um, but also high efficiency. Um, in the range that we operate with, uh, there's no significant energy consumption difference or benefit of the direct drive compared to a belt drive. Um, high availability of motors. These are off the shelf motors that uh, we typically use on these things. We don't want people to have to call and order special motors or anything like that. Um, that gets real expensive and time consuming. And these days lead times are an issue with everything. So it's always best to go with anything that you can that's uh, typical. Uh, playing off the shelf part. Uh, the bowl is decoupled from motor, which means if there's an issue with the motor or an issue with the bowl, they're not going to damage each other. They're not, uh, not connected together directly and easy maintenance. As I said before, the, uh, motor can come off there really easy. Belt's really easy to work on. Um, impeller system. Most of these, uh, centrifuges all have an impeller in the top. Uh, or an impeller in them somewhere, which basically scoops the beer out of the machine as it's rotating, pushes it back, pumps itself back to the uh, to the tank, wherever it's going to. Um, there's different impeller designs that create different pressure levels uh, for different types of tanks and different types of applications, but that's something that's always optimized on site. Um, you know, typically they have a good idea of where to start, and if uh, if it needs to be changed, it's pretty easy to do. The hydrohermetic seal versus a mechanical seal. Um, the only downside is deaerated water is required for it. We do some have some customers that just use tap water, uh, some room temperature tap water. And in most cases that works pretty well also. Um, so not really much of an issue there. Um, it's nice to have the hydrohermetic seal, like I said, because you don't have to deal with the mechanical seals and you don't have to risk any uh, potential seal damage and uh, product contamination. Um, Non-hermetic. Uh, hood design. It's, we don't have any kind of special design uh, there. No, it, it, we don't have to have a vacuum pump or a CH, CO2 uh, pumped into there or anything like that. Um, it is. A, uh, there's a note down there at the bottom. It is, of course, a closed system just because it says not a hermetic design. It's still a, a sealed design. Uh, this is a little bit of physics for you in case anybody doesn't know really how the centrifuge concept works, but um, as you generate the g-force from the bowl speed rotating, uh, the centrifugal force pushes your solids out towards the uh, outer edge of the bowl. Your liquid is forced up the inner disc radius while your solids are displaced uh, towards the, I guess, the underside of the upper disc which is uh, the G-force forces the, the solids out to there where they slide down the disc and out towards the, the edge of the bowl. So it's basically um, centrifugal force moving your, your solids out and away while it forces the liquid back up the discs towards the impeller. Um, the impeller, the best way to describe the impeller in these things is it's basically a pump. The only difference is that rather than the impeller rotating the entire pump body is rotating around it, forcing the liquid into the impeller. Um, but for all intents and purposes, you could call these a, a self pumping machine. Uh, this is just a little comparison to show the difference because there are so many different kinds of clarifiers and separators and uh, you know, the architecture and the design of these things is almost infinite. They've been around for the better part of a hundred years. Uh, and they have, you know, many, many uses across many industries. So the main difference is the difference between a two phase and a three phase where a three phase machine, which would be on the right, will separate solid from oil, from water or another heavy phase liquid. Uh, basically that's done by uh, cutting some holes in the discs. You'd have uh, some three or some light phase discharge holes cut in the uh, surface of some of your discs and your oil phase would be forced up through those uh, holes through the disc um, and then discharged by gravity out of the top. And then your, uh, your heavy liquid or your water will be discharged through an impeller uh, under gravity. 
And this is interesting uh, to me, especially because Flawig makes a machine called a tricanter, which is a horizontal decanter. It also separates three phases, uh, but does it with a much heavier solids content. So depending on your solids uh, content in the feed, you could either use a three phase separator like this or a three phase decanter. Uh, and we've done a lot of projects with, with both kinds of machines and they, they both have their place in industry. It just depends on the, the feed stream that you're trying to separate. <clears throat> Most of the time in beer, we don't see much in the way of oils. There are some hop oils, obviously, with, associated with hops, but there's not enough volume to separate out any oils. So this is something that typically happens in uh, distilling or other areas where we'd have more oils involved. Um, this is a, a standard disc for a, a typical clarifier. You can see it doesn't have any holes cut in the uh, the middle of it there or anything like that. And it just shows the, the path where your solids and your uh, liquid are traveling. This slide here uh, is to demonstrate the capacities of the different range of centrifuges. So we have a full range of uh, separators starting with the AC 1200, which would handle up to about 50 barrels per hour. Um, as we go up the line, obviously everything increases in capacity. There are several different models. Um, we'll look at some of the sizes. And as far as physical size goes uh, shortly here, but this just shows the capacities. You can run upwards of 400 barrels per hour in the, uh, the larger machines. And um, again, that also depends on the type of separation you're doing and how you're finishing the beer. If you were, uh, say, going to um, do a more macro brew type of situation where you're um, doing green beer clarification and then separating before going through filtration, uh, you might see a little bit higher throughputs as well. Uh, you probably get closer to 500 barrels an hour. But for, for craft brewing purposes, uh, we typically rate them on the conservative side because um, the solids loads are usually higher in craft beers. Our newest I believe we have an AC 3000 coming out soon, though. I think that that's in development at the moment. But the newest one we have at the moment is the AC 1700 because we thought we needed a machine that would fill in the gap between the, the 1500 and the 2000. That's been really good for us. Some technical features you can see as it goes up in, uh, in size, you can uh, add a couple more, uh, couple more features here. The smallest one, the only thing not available with that one you can see is the individual setup, which means not skid mounted. So uh, some centrifuges you'll see in large breweries mounted on the floor, they're not, not skid mounted, not a plug and play system. You can do that with almost all of them, except for the small one. It's, uh, it's only available on the skid mounted. And then there's uh, an extra motor cover, which they don't have for that one because this is supposed to be a uh, cost effective unit. But as we go up into the larger size, the, the 1500, and the 1700, those are same story, um, available skid mounted, um, but also available individually. So you can set those on the floor or have them completely skid mounted. And once you get up to the larger size, uh, with the AC 2,000, 2,500 and the 2,510, you can see that there's also a, the only thing not available with those is the solids outlet pipe, because on those, we put the cyclone with a pump and the amount of solids that they discharge is too much to put down a, a floor drain. When you get to a machine that big, if you were to just discharge it out of the side of the machine to the uh, to the floor drain, you'd, you'd have quite a mess on your hands. It'd look a little bit like a yeast bomb went off in your brewery. Nobody wants that. Um, you can see the pipe diameter goes up with each one. The installed power goes up with each one. Um, but they all pretty much have the same features from the uh, the smallest one to the largest one in terms of uh, instrumentation and um, options. Another thing that you should look for when you shop for a centrifuge, if this is something that you're looking to add to your brewery, uh, controls. You should always uh, have lots of questions about the controls. What kind of control system does it run? Who can support it? Um, how, who can help you? Will it be in English? Will it be in your language? Um, that's all really important stuff to learn. Make sure that what you're getting is going to be uh, comfortable for you to use and maybe even test one out before you do it. Um, one thing that we love about 
our system is that you can save your recipes in there. If there is a, um, you make an IPA and you make a porter and you make a wheat beer, each one of those settings, you can save your, uh, your settings and go back to it the next time you make that beer. So um, programmable recipes, I always push that. That's something I think everybody should have. Uh, CIP as well. You can adjust that CIP system, uh, fine tune the program and get it uh, right where you want and save all your settings. The peripheral design, uh, this is just a bit about how we would typically design a skid mounted system. Um, Basically, we uh, you can see there's a control panel mounted there. You know, this has got the the basics. It it shows free outlet operating water down there at the uh, the bottom right. That's actually also where the yeast would be discharged from this small machine. This one doesn't have a cyclone on it. It's just um, the pipe discharge into the floor near a drain or something like that. Um, the soft water inlet, which is the operating water, would be the uh, the bottom note down here if my arrow shows correctly and then the next one would be the cip connection cip inlet which is also the same inlet as the product feed um, both would come in there so you can just add, add a t and uh, change that valve whenever you're ready to go to cip product outlet up here which is where your beer is going to be discharged from your clarified beer and then the de-aerated water inlet right here for your hydrohermetic seal. So these are pretty pretty easy plug and play systems. You can see that they uh, they don't require a whole lot. You can set this down, and have it hooked up in a couple hours in your uh, in your brewery. Um, on the right, we got a little checklist here. Got to have CIP media. Got to have your de-aerated water. Got to have the uh, operating water. Operating water is something that. Uh, you should also talk about your supply with your supplier because these machines are all controlled with uh, valves that open and close the bowl. And as soon as they get a little bit of scale on them, those valves want to hang up and your bowl can get hung open. You can start losing product that way. You could constantly be discharging small amounts of beer or get stuck open and lose a lot of it. Um, so good quality operating water is a must, even if it means going to Home Depot and just buying a cheap little uh, water softener or something like that. Just want to make sure that you have some... Uh, good quality water with like a little bit less, maybe just below a hundred PPM of uh, uh, chlorides in it. So that's pretty Im important. Uh, then you got to hook up your power uh, pneumatic connection. It is necessary to have a crane nearby or a, um, I mean, honestly, most breweries are using a forklift with a, a strap on top of it to, to pick that up, but uh, some way to pick up the bowl and uh, lower it into the uh, centrifuge because typically they do not send, uh, ship a centrifuge with a bowl in it. That's a no-no. And then an internet connection for remote control. And by remote control, they don't mean that somebody else is controlling it. They just mean so your supplier can dial in and help you to fine tune things when you need them, which is something they should always be doing or at least always be offering. So here's a little bit about some skid mounted and floor mounted centrifuges. Uh, I wanted to show a couple of examples of designs here. You can see um, that there's a couple different ways to do it. The first one being the floor mounted systems. This one is a picture of an AC 2500 that you can see the valve rack is mounted on the floor next to the machine along with the control panel. Um, this, I would have to guess, there's also an MCC room somewhere with a bigger control panel because the, the panel hanging there on the wall is not quite, uh, doesn't look to me like it's big enough for that large of a centrifuge. So most likely this brewery has an MCC room somewhere nearby that has the, the large control panel in it that houses the VFD and the PLC. And the one hanging on the valve rack there has the uh, pneumatic uh, manifold in it and the touchscreen mounted in the, uh, the front of it. So this is an example of how they would do a system if they were to, to piece it together and install it in the brewery without a, a skid. Uh, this would be a larger skid mounted system. So this one looks like an AC 1500 probably um, size system. These are pretty popular for, this is our, our second smallest system. These are pretty popular in the craft brewery world. It'll handle up to about a hundred barrels per hour, uh, depending on beer styles that you're doing and how you're, finishing it if you're using filtration afterwards or whatever but um, this one does have the full control panel mounted on the skid 
a full operating water system on the skid, the centrifuge, as well as the valves, um, turbidity meters, flow meters, everything on there. And then you can see hanging on the side of the centrifuge here, this big uh, uh, housing here. This is called the cyclone. And typically, this is where we would connect the solids pump. So it would be just sitting on the floor next to it and pumping away your solids as they're discharged into that cyclone. There's a water line at the top of the cyclone to add a little bit of water back to it if it's coming out too dry. Um, but this is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a, a plug and play system here. And then this last one here, this is the, oh, oh, this is the smallest guy. This little guy here is the AC 1200. So this is our entry level craft brewery system. You can see it's got a small control panel on the left side there, the little operating water system just behind it. And then the centrifuge itself mounted on the skid. This guy will handle up to about 50, gallon, 50 barrels per hour. Um, it's uh, truly a little plug and play system. I think the footprint is about one meter by two meters. Um, so just about the size of a picnic table, probably a little bit, maybe a little bit bigger, if that. Squeezes right into a brewery real nice and it's easy to start up, easy to implement. And uh, they're really a really friendly little machine actually. Last point we should talk about here is hygiene. The CIP, obviously this is, again, you can't stress it enough. The cleanliness and the uh, hygienic aspect of these is the most important thing because if it's not clean, you can't use it again. I mean, it'd be a one-use machine. So one thing we work on and we strive for is to have a, a very thorough CIP process, make sure that the machines do clean very well. And therefore, after a uh, after run, there's no disassembly or cleaning of the machine required. It's a fully automated cleaning process. Um, and once it's finished, it'll be ready to go right back into production. These machines have all been tested and verified. Um, I think you'll find with any manufacturer that they have the CIP down pretty well because obviously these machines were originally designed for dairy applications and uh, almost nowhere is it more important than an, in a dairy application to have everything absolutely hygienic. So. Uh, that said, I think every centrifuge you find will have a, a high level of hygienic uh, cleanability, and ours are no exception. Uh, let's see here. A couple of, uh, just a couple of customer things to brag about. This one's from uh, Lexington Brewing Company. They use the AC1500. Uh, they're famous for the Kentucky Bourbon Barrel Ale, and they do a lot of, uh, a lot of it. Their barrel house is huge. They've got loads of beer aging in barrels all the time. They dump it into a, into a big bright tank or into a big uh, intermediate tank. I guess you could call it a buffer tank before centrifugation and carbonation. Um, it's quite an interesting process there, but uh, you know they've done really good. And then uh, Rheingeist here in Cincinnati is another one that we work with. That uh, they use the AC two thousand. Um, to clarify, obviously, a lot of different beers because they make tons of tons of different kinds of beer, constantly changing. Um, but a lot of dry hop beers, a lot of um, a lot of IPAs. So they've done really well with that as as well. And they're actually using the Flawig decanter system followed by the disc stack centrifuge system. So um, those two together have really worked well. That's one. Of my, that's probably my favorite customer. I love taking people there. So. Thanks a lot for your attention. Um, thanks to Andrew and everybody at the Craft Beer Professionals thing for putting this on. Hope everybody's enjoying uh, webinars and stuff today. It's nice to be able to do this. And um, maybe I'll see some of you at the Master Brewers Association Conference next week in Cleveland. Um, if not, catch me on my uh, contact info there at the bottom. Uh, see you next time. Thanks.